Okay, so in this video we're talking about real numbers and operations. This really is the starting point of our course, um, and this is really an algebra one topic. So a lot of what you see here might be reviewed. Okay, so there's different types of real numbers. Um, they start off with the natural numbers, go on to the whole numbers, then the integers, then the rationals, and then the irrationals. So all of those are important to us. So we're going to start off with the natural. So the natural, it's kind of like your counting numbers when you're uh, playing hide and go seek. One, two, three, four, etc. So that's one, two, three, etc. The whole numbers, we just add zero. So we have zero, one, two, three, etc. It goes on like that. Now the integers, we're just adding negative numbers. So we have like negative one, negative two, negative three, but we also have the whole numbers and natural numbers are included. Okay. So we have integers. It's all the negative numbers, so like negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. It goes on forever in both directions. And then finally, the rational numbers, those are fractions, okay, or decimals that end nicely. They terminate like 0.25, or they have a pattern like 0 0.21, 2.1, 2.1, 1, something like that. Okay, but I just think of it as rational as being numbers you can write as a fraction. Okay? So rationals, we do we'll call it nice decimals. And then also fractions. Okay? And then finally, the last piece of our real numbers are the irrational. So it's things that don't behave nicely. So um, nasty decimals like pi or e, etc., or square root of 2. So the irrationals. And then some of those examples are like pi, e, and square root of 2. Okay? So put all those things together and we get what's called the real numbers, and that's typically what we've been using our entire lives. Now later in the course we'll add a new number set called the complex numbers. But for now, we're still just sticking with what we know, which is the real numbers. Alright, so we want to graphically compare these numbers on the number line. Okay, so we can do that. So draw the number line. Obviously, let's put some tick marks up here. So I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. Now, perhaps the easiest way to do this type of problem is to convert each one of these into a decimal. So I'm going to grab a calculator and do that. So using my calculator, just typing in each one exactly the way it looks. And so negative four thirds, negative four thirds is about is about negative one point three repeating. Okay? So negative one point three repeating is somewhere about right here. Okay, square root of two. Type it in. It's about 1.414. Okay, so this is approximately 1.414. Okay, which is approximately somewhere about right here. And then finally, 2.7. That's pretty easy to put on the number one because it's already in decimal format, and that's somewhere about right here. So we have all three numbers listed. Now again, if you can convert those to decimals, that's great. Some of them might be nice. You can do it by hand. Like negative four thirds, you can probably do that um, by hand in your head. Some of them like square root of two. Unless you have that decimal, the first couple of decimal places memorized, you might need to use a calculator. All right, so we got a couple properties that we have used over and over again throughout our mathematical careers, but we probably have taken advantage of. So these properties are called the closure, commutative, associative, identity inverse and distributive property. And these properties work for both addition and multiplication. 
Now, some of these properties will work for subtraction and division, but not all of them. So we're not going to talk about those here in this video. We'll save that discussion for class. So first, the closure property. So here I'm just saying that A and B are both real numbers. So all this means, this notation up here just means A is a number, B is a number, and both of those numbers are real numbers. I don't know what those numbers are, but it could be anything. It could be a fraction, it could be a decimal, it could be a nasty fraction, it could be a nasty decimal, it could be a negative number, it could be zero, etc. Okay, so if I have any two numbers, and I'm talking about addition, I'm talking about addition properties. So if I add any two numbers together, well, I still get some kind of real number. For example, 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 is a real number. Commutative property says the order doesn't matter. So A plus B is the same thing as B plus A. Okay, The order that I add it does not matter. The associative property uses grouping. So I'm going to use A plus B plus C and put these in parentheses. But I can regroup those. I could say, all right, well, instead I'm going to do A plus B first plus C. Okay, grouping doesn't matter. Remember, we use parentheses to group, and based on the order of operations, we take care of parentheses first. The identity. So here we have what's called the identity element. So zero is our identity element for addition. So A plus zero equals A. All that means is identity is you get yourself. So identity is like your self-identity. Think of it that way. If I take any number and add it to zero, then I'm going to get that same number back. Okay? I keep its identity. It doesn't change. The inverse, we're going to be talking about the additive inverse. So we add a number, we have a number plus its additive inverse. And I get the identity. So sometimes this is called the opposite. So I'm going to take a number, let's say I have negative 1 plus its opposite, positive 1. Negative 1 plus positive 1 is 0. 0 is our identity. So when we're thinking about the inverse, we're taking something and adding its additive identity, additive identity, additive inverse, excuse me, to get the identity. Okay. And then finally, the distributive property. This is probably one of the most important properties you've heard of and used a lot, but it's just we have something like this. And we can distribute. We can distribute all the way across. So we have AB plus AC. Okay, just something like that. This is a super powerful tool. You need to be sure you know that. If you don't know anything else, you need to be sure you know the distributive property. Let's go over to the multiplication properties. Now, a lot of these are going to be very similar. Okay, so we're still using A and B as our real numbers. So closure. Well, if I multiply two numbers together, let's say 1 times 2. 1 times 2 is 2. I still get a real number. The commutative property says that multiplication, the order, does not matter. So AB is equal to BA. Associative property, that's by grouping. When you see associative, you need to think grouping, which means parentheses. So AB times C is equal to ABC. Okay? The way I group things doesn't matter. And identity. So for addition, our identity element was zero because we added something to the identity element to get the same thing back. Now we're looking for a new identity element for multiplication where if we multiply by that identity element, we're going to get the same thing back. So here for multiplication, the identity element is 1. So anything times 1 is itself. And then the inverse, we're looking for something times its multiplicative inverse to get the identity. So something times its multiplicative inverse to get 1. And what we're going to do is just we're going to take the reciprocal. So A times 1 over A is equal to 1. Think about it. 2 times 1 half is 1. Okay? Negative 1 half times negative 2 is positive 1. And then finally, the distributive property is actually absolutely the same. So I'm just going to say same. I don't know why I put it twice, but it's the same as what we just talked about. Okay? 
and then unit analysis. So what you really need to think about when we're doing this is why is it important for us to, to use units when we're solving problems? Well, think about it. If you're working in real world problems and you're in a job somewhere and you give your boss an answer of four and they're trying to make a decision on purchasing materials or something based on that four. Well, for what? Four feet, four inches, four miles, four light years. What are you talking about for? So you need to include units. Okay, so this is really for real world situations. Okay? It's always important to specify what you're talking about. Okay? And what's some typical units? Well, we just talked about some. So inches, feet, yards, meters. Kilometers, times in there, so seconds and hours, etc. So there's a lot of them, okay? Some of these units will be very familiar to you, some of them will not be necessarily familiar. So that's okay, we'll learn them as we go. And what if they're different units? Okay, I mean, what happens? So this is what we're talking about the unit analysis. Essentially, we're going to treat the units like a variable and they're going to cancel out, okay? So treat the units like a variable. What I mean by that is, you know, you can combine like terms, okay? So if I have one foot and one foot, you have two feet, okay? Or if I have one hour divided by one hour, well, that's just one. The hours cancel out. We're going to do an example of this on the next page. All right, so here, let's we've got several problems. I'm going to just go through these, and we're going to talk about, you know, what's going on. So the first problem, 345 miles minus 187 miles. But it's just a matter of combining like terms, just like we would do with variables, okay? So I'm just going to use my calculator to knock out pretty quick. You can do it in your head if you want to. So this is 158. But you got to think about your units. So this is miles. I'm just going to use mi or miles. Now you can actually write out the word if you want to, but typically mi is what you're going to see. All right, so here I've got, all right, well, I'm going to take care of my numbers first. So 1.5 times 50. which is 75, but now I need to take care of my units. Well, I have hours up top, hours on bottom. So, you know, just like if we divided, we had two on top, two on bottom for a fraction, we would know we just get one. They can eat. Those twos cancel each other out. Same thing with the hours. Hours up top, hours on bottom, cancel out. All that's left over is miles, so this is 75 miles. Okay. $24 divided by three hours. Okay, well, unfortunately, no units cancel out, so all we can do is take care of our take care of our numbers. So 24 divided by three is eight. So I have eight, to, eight up top, and it's $8 divided by one hour. So that's kind of like you're making $8 an hour at your job. Okay, this next problem. Now, here's a common mistake students make when we're dealing with a problem like this. We have lots of fractions. You multiply straight across for the top and straight across for the bottom. So I'm going to take care of the numbers up top first, just the numbers. I'm not worried about the units yet. So I've had 88 times 3600 times 1. So I end up with 3,000, or sorry, 300 and 16,800 up top. And then on bottom, I have 1 times 1 times 5,280. So 5,280 on bottom. Okay, so I've taken care of the numbers, so all that's left to do is to take care of my units. I have feet up top, feet on bottom. So these two are going to cancel out. Notice I'm just canceling out the units, I'm not canceling out numbers. I have seconds on bottom, seconds on top, they cancel out. And all that stuff is miles on top and hours on bottom. So miles per hour. Okay? Well, I don't want to leave my fraction like that. You should always reduce your fraction as much as possible. So I'm going to try to see if I can simplify that fraction. So 316,800 divided by 5,280. And it comes out to be a nice 60. So this one is equal to 60 miles per one hour. 
that's typically a speed that we would see in our cars, like on the freeway or something like that. And that's it for this video. Thank you very much.